Morning everyone, my name is Theol Hamza and I will be conducting the training on the new ZK Access 3.5 today. Right, before we get into this, ZK Access 3.5 is our free desktop based software. So it's a desktop solution which means you install it directly onto the PC. It's mostly known for use for basic access control functions. The software is completely free and it has no license involving the activation. We will go through some specifications of the software before we go over to the installation as well. And what I'd like you guys to do is if you guys do have any questions that you want to ask throughout the webinar or if you want to ask questions at the end if there's something you want to know or you feel like I've left out or you need I need to elaborate on you can either leave the questions inside the webinar tab or you can send an email to the email I will provide at the end of the seminar and I'd just like to thank all of you guys that are, are joining and without further ado, let's go through to the PDF settings. Some of the special, some of the specifications. So as you can see, we have ZK Access 3.5, our access control management solution. And you can see some screenshots of what the software does look like. Okay. As a professional access control software, ZK Access 3.5 is designed to manage all ZK Techos access control panels and standalone devices. This being said, it allows you to use all it allows you to use all of our standalone terminals to the software, as well as our controller series like the C3, the C3 series, as well as the InBio series. The software does not unfortunately support any clean label series products such as our Pro Captures, our Pro Faces or our InBio Pro controllers. It does support some of our time and attendance terminals like the i one or the iClock 90 as well, but it's not recommended as those are standalone time and attendance terminals and this is just an access control based software. Uh, it's a desktop software which is suitable for small and medium business applications and the brand new flat user interface design and humanized structure of the ZK Access 3.5 will make your daily management more pleasant and convenient. Then you can see some of the positives that we have there. It has a brand new user interface, a one-click sync system, it has both TNA and access control. We will basically just go over the access control today. Our auto IP detection, this works especially with all devices that have pool for me, so all of our controllers as well as the F16 device. Our real-time monitoring and plus 20 custom reports that you can set up. Then if you have a look at some of the software specifications, the default database is Microsoft Access. It also supports SQL Server 2005 and above. And then supported operating systems is Windows 8 up until Windows 10. We support both the 32 and the 64-bit variant. Then you can see some of our software features. Um, it's easy to configure and use. It has a nice menu, different dashboard display. It does have an embedded fingerprint registration tool. So if you do have a ZK4500 enrollment or take-on device, you will be able to do registration very easily from or fluidly from the software. And it also has quick start links for common operations. Then our door management settings in the software, individual door configuration for unlock duration, wagon formats and request to exit modes, etc. You can set anti-passback and interlocks so basically the interlock is for man trap control. In and out reader configuration, this is only applicable to a controller. 
and then also the programming of the REST password. And you have your real-time monitoring. This will basically show you the door statuses. And it also brings up a user photo. If someone does access the door and a user photo has been enrolled, we will discuss that when we get to the software inside of it. You do have remote opening and remote closing of individual doors. Then if you know about maps, reports, and maintenance, you can import maps and floor plans for site-specific door management. Report to the customized search engine. Once again, this is just an access control report. We will just touch on the access control today. Multiple export formats for event logs. Now, one click database backup and then all system changes are logged in case something has been changed and you want to go back and follow up on it. So those are some of the most basic functions in Nexus 3.5 as well as some specifications. Right. And now that we've done that, we can actually go ahead and I will actually show you the software installation today. That. So the new build of Access 3.5 that we have is Zipka Access 5.3, is 3.5.3, build 14. It is a more stable build and it's also a lot more secure. You can download this build from our international website, which is www.zketeco.com. And once you've downloaded the software, you can basically just go ahead and double click on the setup. Then it will bring up the language interface. You can select the language that you prefer. It does support quite a few. We will just go with English for now. Your terms and conditions, you can just read through that, except click on I accept the agreement. Next, it will create a setup install file for Access 3.5 under your C drive. You just have to make sure that all space, the space is big enough. Then the system will create a program shortcut in the following start menu. Click on next, and then you can select either default database or other. So other you will have to set up your MS SQL 2005 or higher, but we will go with the default database. Click on next, and then it's going to ask you to browse to create a path for your software backups. I'm just going to click make new folder and then, and then you can just create a folder where you wish to save your backup. Select the folder and click OK. And then you click on next and then it will bring up the installation prompt. If you want to go back and change any settings you can or you can just cancel the installation. And then you can click install and then the software process will start. Then after the installation is done, the next process that will start is your fingerprint driver SDK. This will install the SDK for your ZK4500 take-on reader. Click on next, click on install. 
it's a nice and quick process and then you can just click on finish to finish up the process then access 3.5 will ask you to either yes restart the computer now or now I'll restart the computer later being a desktop solution as well as our entry level software it's not necessary to restart the software as it does not need any important processes so you can just click on now you'll restart the computer later okay, just close that up and then it will create a shortcut on your desktop for you So if you double click on the shortcut, it will open the software. As you can see, this is a new folder to process the abnormal SDK. And in the background, it will also check your database versions to make sure that everything is correct. Once that is finished, the message will close. All right, then you have to log into the software for the first time. If you are using the default database and you just did the straight installation, the default password will be admin admin, both lowercase. And click the tab to remember me and then just click on login. Right, then as soon as you launch into the software, it will give you, provide you with the navigation panel. So the navigation panel is in a sort of, in a sense, a way to direct you on how to set up the software from the back. Obviously on the first, we have the device, then we have personnel, and then all our access control settings, and then as well as our real-time monitoring where you finish up. So we are going to use this as basically our backdrop template for the training. We will start off with our device and then progress through our personnel, then our access control, and then we can just have a quick look at the reports as well as the system tab. Okay then, so the first, the first tab that we will be discussing is our device tab. That is the most important tab inside the software as you'll need to add your device first to make sure that you can get the programming running and sync all users after you've added your personnel to the device. So you can either click on device there or at the top and then it will open your device tab which you will see has area, device, and then search device. We will discuss some of the other options as well. So the first thing that you do is, is you'll have to set up an area for your software. This is not a requirement, it's not necessary, but if you want to make it very specific, you can add an area. So for example, you are always given a default area. You cannot delete the default area, but you can edit it. So we will just change the name to the Kitaka office. Area number one, no parent area, and Linux. Then you can also add another one. For example, the repairs department. And then you can select ZKTIC office as the parent area and then you can add it as it. So it will basically create a tree view for you that branches out. Then some of the other features that you have is also edit, delete, or you can export it. Most of the tabs in ZK Access 3.5 do have the export tabs. It will use Excel or the text files for exporting. Access 3.5 does not export to PDF or CSV. All 
All right, then after you've done that, you can basically go and set up your device. Now, important thing to remember, if you are using a standalone device, which just has standard firmware on, you will not be able to search the device. So clicking on search the device, this will search for all devices on the network that does have the pool firmware. So if we click on search, we should be, be, be able to pick up something. If not, we know that there are no devices on the network that have the pool firmware enabled. Just give it some time to load through. There you can see it says it cannot search any controller as no controllers were picked up on the network. So for the purpose of the training, um, searching, adding a controller that you've already picked up on the network is pretty easy. You just double click on it and then click on add the device and then it will add the device to the software. But for the purpose of the training, we will go the long way and add it manually. So it's important to remember that if you do add a device manually, it has to be on your on your network range in range with the PC as well so you can most of our standalone devices you can change the IP on the terminal itself so for today's testing purposes we are using a multi by 700 which is a facial fingerprint reader also supports card. So the first thing that you do is you click on add. You can either select the wizard mode or you can just click on the left hand bottom and use professional then it lays out everything just into one page. You don't need to click next, next, next. So the first thing that you do is you test give the device a name. You can either call it the device name itself or you can call it the front door. You can take communication password. This is not recommended. If you do set a communication password and your software crashes or your PC crashes, you'll have to remember the communication password again if you wish to add the soft the device. And it is something that you do forget very easily because it's not something that's used often. Then you can select the device type that you have. So having a multi by 700, that's a standalone device. You also have your one door up to four door access control panels, as well as standalone pool device like your F16. It's not necessary to change these settings as the software will correct itself when adding the device. And you have auto synchronize device time with PC. You can select the area that you've created for the device. You can clear all data in the device when adding it. So that is if you did test and you're taking it to a client, you can just remove all the data. And then your most important part, your IP address. So this is the IP address that you've set the device to using the menu interface on the device itself. So I've already set up the IP, it's 10.0.128. The IP port number is default 4370. It's not necessary to change that. And then you can go ahead and test the connection to make sure that you are connecting to the device. So we have connection time out. Probably work if I do plug in. It would most probably work if I plug in the laptop on the network. And then, if you want to go further and you want to test the connection, what you can do is use your built-in command prompt. 
and ping the IP address to make sure that you are getting a communication. So now if we click on add and we do the step again, and then if we test connection, it says connection successful and then you can just click on OK and then save and continue will basically add the device and then open up the interface again so that you can add the next one. As you can see in this list, there you will see the device connected successfully, but the controller match does not the controller does not match with the actual type and it will be changed to correct controller type standalone device. And then you have added your device. Straightforward and simple steps. A lot easier than some of our other softwares. So when you've added the device, you can see a few information about it. For example, you will be able to see the serial number of the device. You'll be able to see the communication type, the IP address that you've assigned to it, the serial port, if it's RS485 communication, if the device has been enabled, it will give you the total quantity of personnel fingerprint, um, fingerprints in the software, vein quantities, facial quantities, and as well with our new build 40 and some of our new devices that are released, as well as palm vein templates. It will also show you the firmware version and then the area name that you've added it to. Now then, if you have a look at some of the features at the top, you can see that you have get logs. This will pull all attendance records from the device. Sync all data to the device. will send all the information that you've changed in the software to the device. And then getting personal data as well as personal information from the device, that will pull all existing users from the device to the software. As you can see, we have zero templates or personnel inside the device so it does not even matter that we put it through and that is it for the device tab you can go view some of the more settings as well like modify the ip address setting up wi-fi if the device supports wi-fi connection Synchronizing the time and then syncing new changes to device will basically sync any changes that you made to the software that it does not have on instead of syncing all the information through a game. All right, then we can go ahead to the next tab, which is our personnel. Now the personnel tab is where you will be doing all your registration inside the software. The first thing that you'll have to do is go from top left to bottom is our departments. 
so your departments are just another method of viewing employees into a group, for example. If you click on departments, you will see that you have a default department already created called company name. Once again, you cannot delete the default department, but you can modify it. So if we click on edit, instead of calling it company name, we can call it Seketeco Management, for example. Department number one, and then no department area. And just like the area, you can create multiple departments to branch out. So we can just go ahead and add a few here as examples. And then for example, if you do, you can change the parent area as well. For example, we do have the repairs. So there we've basically just added a few departments. And then if you click on tree view, it will show you how the trees branch out. So like I said, that this is no real significance to the software itself. This is just some extra information that you can sort your employees by. Then off to your departments, as you can see, you can also input and export this to your Excel or your text document. And then if you click on personnel, this is where you'll do your registration and your input of employees. As you can see, you can click on add. And then we can go ahead and ahead and register our first user inside the software for our device. So the first thing that you need is by indicated by the red asterisk that these are required information. Without this information, you cannot save or continue on ahead. So the first thing that you can do is you can enroll your personal ID. It's nine digits long and it's not allowed to start with the letter nine or eight. But now we'll just do it one and it's also not alpha numerical. It is only support, it only supports numbers. You can choose a department for the user and then you input the name the last name. You can input the card number in case the card number is provided on the tag itself. Or you can use a take on readers like a CR20M. Or you can get the card number by ticking on that, selecting your device, and then it will start reading. So in a sense, if you swipe a tag now, it will pull the card number through. Then you have some extra information that you can put in, like mobile phone, the date the user was hired, a birthday, and then password is also another essential part of information when it comes to the user. This does not create a password for the software. This sets up a password for the device that the user can use for clocking, in case you want to. Then you get your email as well as your privilege. Your privilege setting will change your user privilege on the device itself. So if you're just a normal user, you'll be able to clock on the device. As soon as you set it to admin, 
it will sync the data to the device and lock the device down so that nobody will be able to access the menu. So that only the admin can access the menu for further enrollment or settings. Then you have your user profile pic. You can see that there is your optimal size. You can either browse or shoot a photo. And you can use your web camera now. Or you can just browse and find a picture inside your system which I do not have, and then just select that picture. You will see that there is the optimal size for your profile pic. Then at the, the bottom here, you can see your fingerprint registration. You can either use a USB fingerprint sensor or a USB fingerprint vein sensor, which is also new in this build of software. Or you can use the device in case it is enabled. So if you click on USB fingerprint sensor and you've got your ZK4500 connected to your PC, the only thing that you have to do is yes, you select the finger you want to enroll. You place it three times down on the flatware of the ZK4500 and then that is how you enroll a fingerprint. Quick, easy, and simple. Then you can also select the rest finger. So this is a finger that you'll basically use for exceptions. When you're being held under the, the rest, the rest fingerprint will still open the door, but send out an alarm to the system. Then you can click OK, and that is your fingerprint registration complete. Then you can click on details. So your details tab will, it's just extra information in case necessary you want to fill it in. And then when it comes to your ID number in South Africa, when you put it in, you'll see that it will stop at a certain amount of digits and it won't allow you to save. You just have to input spaces at the front or the end to populate the rest of the data as it requires more digits than the length of our South African ID. And then you also have an access levels tab, but we will get to this later as soon as we get to the access control in just a bit. Access level is very important. Without access levels, you won't be able to sync any data to the device. We did not save our user. So let's just quickly run through and just do that again. And then you can save and continue. And then it will basically open the personal tab again so that you can go ahead and then just register your second user. And then if you click on OK, you'll see that there are your two users added to the software. Now, as you can see, it will tell you what quantity that you have, which type of algorithm fingerprint you have. The ZK4500 is kind enough to provide you with both of 
the qualities. So ZK4500, which is it, it's always recommended to tag one on site or use a ZK4500 because you, if you have all the devices or devices that support algorithm nine, ZK4500 provides you with nine and 10. So you'll be able to run all devices along with new devices perfectly. Then you have issue card, just to add a card to a user. You can go ahead and select a user, and then as soon as you swipe the tag on a take on reader, it will pull the card number through to the software. Or if you don't wish to do it like that, you can use the batch issue option which you can either use device or a USB enrollment. And then if you select, if you input a query for a personnel list and you swipe cards, it will assign the cards from top to bottom as the personnel come over. A lot easier for those bigger sites so that you can basically just tell the users to queue up and then as you swipe tags, you can hand it to them in the order that they stand. All right, and that is it for your personnel tab. Not a lot of difficult settings to add. Right, and ladies and gentlemen, before we continue on, I just want to remind you guys that if you guys do have further questions, there is a questions tab in the webinar that you can ask me, or you can send an email to the email I'll provide after the seminar. So if anything is unclear to you, just, just drop me a question and I'll answer, you, I'll answer you as best as my knowledge can. And we can go ahead to our access control. All right, so as soon as you click on access control, you'll see that it opens the real-time monitoring page. The real-time monitoring is where all your clock-in happens for the device. As you can see, there is our front door reader that we've added. Now, the color of the door might change depending on if you have a door sensor added to your unit or if you set it up like that. We will get to, let's discuss the real-time monitoring while we are here. So basically, all clock-ins or clock-outs will appear here on the system. So for example, if a user comes to the software and they put their finger down, that was because of the tamper switch not correctly pressed in. Nothing wrong with that. We just have to go into the device, which I have right next to me, and then just disable the alarm. And then our verification failure. So if it does give you verification failure, you just have to go make sure that the verification settings on the device are correct, which we will be able to find in the door setting. So if we click on time zone, which is our first setting in our access control tab. You are left with the default time zone of 24 hours. Once again, you cannot delete the default time zone, but you can add a new one. 
then by adding a new time zone, you just click on add, give the time zone a name and a remark, and then drag the times in as you wish. So you can just drag a small little time and then edit the time as well to make it more sufficient and accurate. And then you can just go ahead and drag that across your week and for your holiday times. Then for your holidays, just extra information for the software. You can click on add, and then you can go ahead and add a new holiday. This is for your holiday type. As you can see, we can click on New Year's. You input the date, it cannot be a very late date. Is it a recurring holiday? You can input remarks if necessary, and then you have 24 holiday numbers that you can choose from for each holiday type, and then you can choose a holiday time zone, which is one for 24 hours. And then you'll see that there's a prompt on your left-hand side which says sync now. You can just click on sync later if you do not wish to send the data through yet. Then you have your door settings. This will change settings on the device itself. So as you can see, you have your front door. You can select the device and edit to change it, the name. So for example, you can call it instead of front door one, you can call it front door in, if it is the in reader or depending on your solution. Then you have your door active time zone, which is 24 hours accessible. Your passage mode time zone, which you can set up once again. Your verification type as any, or you can select it to do either face, fingerprint, and password, or depending on the method that you want. We'll leave it on any for now. Your door sensor type, if it's normally open or normally closed, in case you do have a door sensor connected to it. If you want to enable time and attendance or not on the device. Then your lock open duration, how long the lock relay will stay open. You can set it down to one second. The external alarm delay, in case you have an alarm connected to it, the total of failure times. And then if you want to enable a switch relay board for an external relay. Then you can go ahead and change the weekend settings as well. Or you can just copy all the settings to the current panel or all the devices in case you do not wish to set them one by one. So if we click on OK, once again the sync notice appears, we'll sync later. And that is all the settings that you have under your door settings. Then your access levels. This is the, one of also one of the most important parts in the software. Without the access levels, you will not efficiently be able to sync data to the device. And without that, nobody will have access to the door. Right. So if we click on add, you will see on the left hand side, you will see the users that you've added as well as your device, and it is called unauthorized doors and unauthorized personnel. 
So in order to authorize them, you have to bring these to the right hand side. So you select your time zone for your access level. And then you can input a access level name, which you can just call the default or the normal access. Then you can just either double click or click on the arrows to bring all your users to the right. And if you click on OK, the access level will create. And then you can click on sync now to synchronize the device. And then while you are synchronizing the data to the device, you will notice that the device restarts inside the process as well. All right, then if you click return, then it is finished. So before we can go on, we can go to real-time monitoring and we can check if our data has synced to the device. Just wait for the device to connect to the software again. Alright, so then we can go ahead and we can test if our fingerprint works on our multi-device. After we've disabled the temple on again. Alright, so then if I place my finger. Let's refresh the page again. You can place your finger and then you will see that your device is successfully verifying you. Then you can go to your other settings. So after access levels, you can go ahead to your anti-passback settings. Now please take note that anti-passback only works when you have a slave device connected to either a standalone terminal or if you are using a controller. So, for example, you can use your front door device. You can select the anti-passback, which it needs, and then your in and out state, this will also determine the state of your master. So if I select this as out, my master reader will be in. We'll sync later. All right, then you can go ahead to your personnel group. Your personnel group is useful, especially when it comes to your multi-card opening situations. Now, multi-card opening is used for using is used for enrolling or setting up multiple users to open a door. So, creating a personal group is very straightforward. Give it a group name, any remarks of necessary, a group number. 
the verification type and if they're available on a holiday, on a holiday you click on OK. Sync later, and then you can just add your personnel as well to the group. Then your multi card opening. That's not added now because we are not using a valid personnel group as well. Then you have seen your real time monitoring tab, and then you can go ahead to your map setting. Your map setting is exactly the same as real time monitoring. The only exception being is you can actually add a floor plan here and place the doors on their corresponding position. All right, then after that, we can go to our advanced access, which here you can use for some of your more advanced features. And then please take note that most other features under the advanced access control is based for controllers only. So you have your Wigan format, which you can change if you want to set the odd bits priorities and the total bits. Then your interlocking system, I'll just discuss this. The interlocking system is basically a man trap setup that we use at our banks, for example. This is especially good if you wanna use it in a passageway. Our man traps do work a little bit differently though. Our interlocking system means that if the first door that you've got access to is not closed, you will not be able to verify on the second door. So it does not sense if the first door is closed that the second one will automatically open. It just means that verification is blocked for the second door in case the first one is still open. Then you have your linkages. Linkages is set up for a controller, for example, if you want certain events to trigger different outcomes. For example, if you wire up an auxiliary input, for example, a brake loss unit, you can set up the linkage that if the brake loss is unit, the door must open. Then you have your first card normal open setting. What this does is, as soon as you have a user that is registered for first card normal open, as soon as this user swipes his card on the door, it will open for the duration of the passage mode, and then it will close back when the passage mode ends. Then you have your reader settings, just another feature for the controllers to change the reader type settings name. And then your auxiliary input and output settings, nothing you can change here except editing the name of your auxiliary inputs and outputs. So most of the features under the advanced access control are used for the controller series, such as the C3 and the InBio controllers. And it does not work with standalone terminals. All right, then we have almost reached the end. We have our reports as well as our system tab left. Now, for your reports, this will basically show you all the events that happened to your device. As you see that you can query the time of which it happened. And then if there are no reports to search, the only thing that you have to do is you have to go to your device tab. You click on get logs and then either get new or get all. And you also have the option to clear the logs after you've downloaded it. Once that is done and you go back to your reports tab, there you'll see that there are some missing reports that the software did not pick up. Then you can also use some of the fields 
that you have yet to query reports, for example, via a user. Then you have all your exception events. These are all your events that happen that are not green. So basically, as you can see, there is our two incidents of our tamper alarm going off. All right, and then you can go ahead to your custom reports as well, where, is where you can basically set up a custom access control report based on different fields that you wish to see. You can use that report to query some information for yourself. All right, and then our last tab that we can go ahead to is system. The system does not have any effects to the device itself. This does all changes to your software itself. For example, on the left-hand side, you can see there's your database connection, which will show you which database you've got connected to. Like you can see that we are connected to the access database. Then your backup database, as soon as you click on that, it will save a backup in the folder that you've created inside in the installation steps. You can restore the same database from a file or from a backup that you've made. Set up a backup path. Now there's an important feature here as well. It does have the option to back up the database when you exit the software, which is recommended, I believe, so that if something does go wrong, you at least know that you do have a backup placed somewhere. Then data clean, basically setting up the schedule for, for when logs are cleared in the system or commands or access control records. And then repair access database. If you wish to restore a database, it will just repair the database if some information is missing. All right, then some more system settings. You have your roles, which is your default role is as, is as administrator. Then you can click on add to create a different role for a different user with not all the features. For example, you can use your personnel tab or you can just give them access to browse The real time monitoring. Then the user, you'll have to create a user for the roles that you've created. So you could give it a username.
your role as a monitoring and then the status normal disabled is self-explanatory. Then you can also change the password of the system of the user that you're currently logged into. So as you know that the old password is admin, so you can just change it to something new. Your system initialization, this will default everything in the system. So if you tick all the boxes, it will wipe your system clean and you'll basically have a new system on your hand. Then your system parameter settings, some extra features. If you want to enable the time and attendance module, you just tick that box. The time for obtaining new logs, if you wish to set that. The reconnect interval for, for devices, you can set that lower as well. The photo and real-time monitoring loss for how long, system font settings, the page setting, page size, and the calendar type. Then you have your navigation panel, which is the panel that we saw when we launched the software. And then select language, which is your different languages that you can select, as well as exit the software. Now, before we do close off, just wanted to let you know some more features. If the eye on the top right, this will provide you with the information of the software that you're currently using, your SDK version and your software version, as well as your pool SDK version. This is very important to remember if you guys do struggle with some problems, it might be an SDK problem for the technical guys here at ZK Tech to sort that out. And then the question might also provide you with an in-house manual for the software. And that is Access 3.5, ladies and gentlemen. If you guys do have any other questions, uh, please let me know now. I'll keep the seminar open for the next 15 minutes so that I can get your questions in and see if I can answer you as successful as possible. And then if you do not have any questions now and you feel like you are going to run into some questions, on screen you can see the email address that you can send your questions to. Just support it to support at zketeco.co.za, that is our South African line, uh, where the email is to for South Africa. If you send it to the .com email, it's going to end up in China and you might not ex get feedback soon as um, feedback, you won't get your feedback back very soon. And then we also have our te technical service hotline if you want to phone in and ask some questions about the software, if there's anything that you want to know. You can also leave me questions inside the question inside the questions web tab inside your webinar as well. And I will have a look at it there. All right, guys, thank you for joining the webinar. I will be shutting it down. I will be shutting it down now. I'd like to say thanks to all who attended. Our next training is next week Tuesday which will be on ZK Biosecurity Part 1. Joseph will be handling the training and he will be discussing the personnel, the device tab and some of the access control features. I hope you guys have a pleasant day further and enjoy the rest of the week.